Hi, and welcome to Rocky Mountain Sewing and Vacuums November 2021 Sew Fun. I'm Kathy Elsesser, and uh, if you've been following us online with Sew Fun, you'll know that uh, I did uh, the Sew Fun for November of last year. So I've had a whole year to sew up some stuff for you, and I'm pretty excited about some of the stuff I have to show you. One of the lessons I learned last year was not to do a lot of Thanksgiving stuff a week before Thanksgiving. So I didn't do Thanksgiving stuff this, this time, but you know, it is Christmas season and I just can't resist sewing stuff for Christmas. So I'm gonna show you that stuff first. We're gonna start off with these little gnomes. They're called Quick Knick Sock Gnomes and they are quick, let me tell you. They're made with two types of socks. The regular like um, a crew sock, that's got, of course Christmas fabric, and then the fuzzy socks, like slipper socks, for the for the hat, for the hat and the arms. There is minimal sewing associated with these. You have to sew a seam. You have to uh, sew a seam down the center of the sock to make the legs, and then you just stuff the toes a little bit and then tie them off, and then you sew a seam at the top of the legs like that, and then you set it up so that the heel of the sock is uh, is behind it and you set it down on the table and you start filling it up with rice. And you use three quarters of a cup of rice at a time and get it in there and get it all settled in. And of course this seam keeps it from going down into the legs. And you just keep stuffing it until you're happy. She suggests three cups of rice. And I think I used close to that, maybe three and a half cups on most of mine. Uh, you have to make it, so that's the one, the some sewing you have to do. And then the other sewing that you have to do is you, when the hat, you take the fuzzy sock and you make a little triangle hat out of that. And you take the side pieces when you cut out the triangle to use the, for the arms and you have to sew those together. And then you have to make the nose and you just take a circle of knit fabric. I base it, it's like a three inch circle. She gives you the pattern in the, in the uh, pattern, uh, in the pattern, she gives you the pattern. And then you just sew a basting stitch around the edge, pull it in to gather it in and make this cute little nose. You can make them as big or as small as you want. If you wanna make a bigger nose or a smaller nose, you would just change the size of your circle. And so then you, she does a lot of sewing on these and hand sewing and I'm not a hand sewer uh, very much, don't like it. So I got my glue gun out and I glued everything on. I glued the nose on, I glued the arms on, I glued the hat on and I'm pretty happy with that. Some of the things that I wasn't particularly thrilled about with a pattern is she had you have the arms glued up under the head. And I couldn't quite see having arms above your nose. So I pulled them down and then just glued them onto the side of the gnomes rather than way up here. That just didn't make any sense to me. Uh, it's neater because you don't see it all the seams, but I just didn't like that. And the fuzzy sock itself is difficult to use in the sense that it kind of comes apart. So I did seam around the edges of all of them before I did, you know, ran a stitch around the edge to help them from completely unraveling. I think if I had them to do over again, maybe I would just use fleece for the hat and the arms. It would make it easier to deal with than the fuzzy sock. Although the fuzzy socks are pretty cute because you can get them in all these different patterns. You know, here's, here's one idea and here's another one. It's the same way. The beard is fake fur. We brought in some of that. And it is a long piece of long fur. It's actually called gorilla fur. And you can uh, actually get four, maybe five gnome the beards out of that. And again, the gnome pattern is also, it, the beard pattern is also in the package. What was really helpful to get the um, stuffing in the toes and in the hands were these OESD alligator clips. You know, we have a lot of purposes for these, particularly when you're doing freestanding lace things and have the little buttons and buttonholes, but they're also very good for stuffing uh, fiber fill down into small spaces. So you, these are great for that. So we also have the OESD alligator clamps available and the fake fur, and that's kind of what you need. And then I just went and found some holly and something to put on the little hat to decorate it and some bells uh, to give them a little jingle. So these are the quick nick snots. <laughs> Say that fast. Quick nick sock gnomes by Happy Heart Patterns. So also along the line of gnomes, I made this pillow from a whole country caboodle, and this is called the Holly Jolly Gnomes. And this is all applique, <clears throat> but you use it's really cool 
because you use one of the Dunrovin tea towels that is, uh, and we brought in these tea towels that are the sage green. And what's nice about this, this technique that she has is you line the gnomes up on the hem of the towel. And then she tells you the measurements and then you sew the rickrack on, on underneath and the, and the loops for the buttons. And then she tells you how much you need to fold up and under, and then you just sew the sides together. So it's very quick. These are quick to make in terms of the pillow goes. The gnomes, of course, I cut out, and I actually um, use my laser cutter to cut the pattern. I digitize the patterns. She has very good drawings in here. So if you want to trace them onto some um, paper uh, with the um, applique wonder or something like that, you can certainly trace them on and cut them out yourself. I like my laser cutter, so I use that. And I even cut out an extra 25 sets. So, so there's three gnomes, so I have 75 more gnomes, uh, 25 complete sets that we're selling if, if you're interested in, in buying some that are already cut. Uh, the fabrics are pretty much what you see here. Uh, there's slight variation in some of them where I ran out of something and had to use something different. So there might be a little bit different. I also cut out some snowflake buttons from, that are made of acrylic and have them so that you can sew them on with your sewing machine and um, they're available as, for sale as well. So this is the uh, whole country caboodle. And not only are this, is this pillow in the, pattern, in the book, booklet, but there's also uh, mug rugs, you use the same gnomes, uh, a canister wrap, a pillow wrap. If you don't wanna make a whole pillow, you can just make a little sleeve to go on the outside of the pillow. So you have a lot of options with this and they're just cute as a button. Uh, there's a third, fourth gnome in the package called Papa Gnome that I did not make the applique for, so you'd have to do that one on your own. So keeping with Christmas, i got a couple more things to show you. Um, I have always really, really liked Nancy Halverson's Art to Heart books. She's got um, a whole bunch of different ones, and I have probably several of the ones that she has that are Christmas-themed. So I got this one, which is called Better Not Pout, and I got it for a couple reasons because what I liked about it, one thing was it's not totally applique. She does have some just piecework quilts and pillows in. So one of the first things that I did was this pillow. It's ho, ho, ho. And it is, <laughs> um, it's just a quilted pillow that's pieced. And the only thing that's applique on here is this little bit of a holly, um, feet, you know, kind of an accent piece, accent to it. And um, I had this fabric and I thought it was just perfect for the, she has a more colorful one in the book than I used, but I, I like this, these uh, matching colors. And then I used the, uh, on the back, of course I had the ho-ho fabric, so it seemed like, yeah, gotta use that. And um, I made the flap like Lynn makes for her pillows. And I wanna show you a little bit about how that's done. Because it is very easy. I had never done it before and I looked it up how to do it. And so you, what you have is you're gonna end up with something that looks like this, right? You have a flap, you have the zipper, and then you have the top piece and the bottom piece of, of the pillow back. And so what you do to start with is you just sandwich the zipper, the flap, and the top piece together like this. And then you just sew a quarter inch down and then you turn it so once you've sewn your quarter inch this way, all the raw edges are together. And then when you turn it, then you're just gonna top stitch it to hold this down. And then the flap will eventually, uh, this is the top, so the flap's on top of it like that, right? And then once you've done that part, then you just take whatever you want for the bottom of the pillow and you're gonna put it right sides together on the other side of the zipper. And again, sew a quarter inch, and I'm just gonna pin it a couple of places so you can see. Pin it a couple of places, and there you go. And now you have a beautifully inset zipper with a pretty little flap. Flap can be the same color as your fabric. It can be different color, it can be contrasting color. Uh, you can really mix it up and have something really cute you know, on the back of a pillow. Especially if you find a fabric like I did that says ho, 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 you could even make this, you know, you could turn your pillow around. Uh, I, do have a, I do have a bench, I had to buy the bench because I made the pillow. And I found a bench that was just the right size to go on my front porch. And so I put ties on it so the wind won't blow the pillow away when it uh, when the wind comes up up in Bailey. So that is one of the projects from the heart to art. She also has this pretty quilt, for example, 
um, that are pieced work. But then she has a lot of applique work and she gives you, of course, all of the patterns and the placement for you to be able to draw them out on paper, on your uh, seam of steam, I'm not seam of steam, but your um, applique wonder or whatever, and then um, cut out the appliques. And so I may, I got kind of, kind of carried away because I really liked a lot of what she had. So this is, and this is one that's just a little, she calls it a mini wall, a mini quilt, I call it a wall hanging. That is the, uh, the Santa that says, be jolly. And then I made this, I cut out of acrylic, this little stand for it to, go, to, to hang on. And um, it's very easy. And you know, I, if you remember some of my earlier sew funds, I really like using um, my embroidery machine to do the quilting after the fact, after the applique is on. So there's a way in the brother machines to scan this and say, and create sort of like a barrier and say, I want you to quilt along the outside of that, but not on the inside of that. So that's what I did for these, was just quilted around the appliques using my, um, my, my dream machine. So this is Be Jolly. And then she shows in the book a lot of her uh, designs uh, she uses on tea towels. And so like here's the Hot Be Jolly as a tea towel. And here's the Snowman as a tea towel. And I thought, well, that's pretty cute. So. I got a tea towel and I got this blue and, blue and white check tea towel and I made it. And once I got the snowman on there in the border, it's like, you know, that's really too big for a tea towel. I mean, you can't even fold it in thirds to hang it to be able to see the design. So it's like, well, I don't want this to be a towel. So I made it another little mini quilt and did the same process that I did for the Santa Claus with the, and then another hanger. Um, I glued the buttons on because I didn't think to sew the buttons on before I quilted it and I didn't want the threads for the buttons showing on the back. So uh, I glued those on. I probably would have, if I'd thought about it, I would have sewn them on. So this is the snowman, let it snow. So that's the second and third projects I did out of that book. And then the last project was also, she showed as a tea towel uh, with, this, with a round uh, applique on the tea towel. And I thought, well, wouldn't that be perfect in a embroidery hoop? So I, I bought a, uh, a 12 inch, a 10 inch hoop and then made the applique and then put it in the hoop. I did put a back on it so you don't see the back, anything in the back. I put a little ribbon around the edge, just, just glued it on. And then I made these holly leaves, which are in the book as a pattern along with the bird and the joy, everything. And I decided, and she, of course in her version of it, they're all applique onto the surface of the towel or the table runner or whatever you're making. Um, but since the ears are going to go on the edge of the, of the embroidery hoop, I made them as freestanding appliques, which you use, of course, no sh um, wash away mesh uh, and use a top and a bottom uh, piece of fabric to make your holly leaves so they're the same front and back. And of course, be sure to use bobbin thread the same color as your top thread, wa um, make them, wash away the wash away mesh, and then you're ready to go with these cute things. And just then I just glued them on with some. Uh, fake rhinestones. So that is the um, projects that I made from uh, the book, Better Not Pout. But again, there are so many other things that she has, this cute ho-ho-ho quilt, which is all piecework. Um, again, towels, table runners with these different things. Uh, and she also has some smaller designs to use as stockings. So to put on stockings. And in fact, this is probably the right size, excuse me, that you would want to use for um, tea towels rather than those big ones. So that is Heart to Art by Nancy Halverson. It's called Better Not Pouch. I did one other Christmas uh, table runner um, from the book called Braided Twist. And what I like about the Braided Twist uh, patterns, and she's got all these different variations that you can use to create these table runners, table mats, place mats, depending on how many circles you wanna use. And in the package is included a tool that you're gonna to use to know where to cut to create the circles that you're making. And the really cool thing about these braided twist runners is that there's no binding to be done and the seam is no hand sewing to be done and it's a magical thing that the seam down the center is, is, it actually hides the open seam that you create when you make this to start with. So what happens is you have, you sew these circles together 
well, they're half circles, and you sew them together in a long line, each half circle, and then you, at the top they're sewn together, and at the bottom they're sewn together, and you have this gap down the center, and then you twist the table, the, the back to the front, and it starts twisting, so you end up with all the fronts here and all the backs here, and that opening is actually hidden inside, and you you completely can, then you completely hide it by using a little bit of seam of steam uh, around the edges. So we brought in some seam of steam as well to use for, um, it's a quarter inch, and you just place little strips along the edge to hold that down. So now you don't see that seam that's on the inside. You don't see the raw edges of the seam. So these are really quick. And another vari variation of that is to actually use wedges so that you get a lot more color in there. And again, the instructions in her book are superb on how to do all that, how to make these, how to cut them out. The tool is well marked. It shows you exactly where you need to place it on your fabric in order to get the circles that you need. Um, and it goes together very quickly. I made both of those runners in less than a day. And what I did find, however, was that this tool, as nice it is, as it is, is very slippery on fabric. And so I had already had in my resource room uh, this stuff called grippy non-slip coating. And so I had, I had uh, Mallory bring that in for us as well because you really need it on the back of this. And it's just a light spray. It dries within two minutes. It doesn't uh, come off on your fabric. And it, it really does help your tool not slip around on the tablet, on the fabric. So if you have any other rulers that didn't have, that are not the Quilter Select, that normally come with a really good grippy stuff um, on the back, you can make your own with this grippy. One of the, I told Mallory um, when we were talking about whether I was going to be doing so fun anymore, and I am going to do one next year, but um, that one of the things I didn't like so much about uh, so fun sewing was sewing garments. Um, I used to sew my garments. I used to make all my, I made all my maternity clothes when I was young. I made formal dresses. I've made my husband a suit coat once, but I just kind of got out of it. You know, to me, they I don't like cutting out. I don't like marking it. There's a lot of things I don't like about it anymore. But, you know, it's so fun and a lot of people do make garments. And so, okay, I'll make some garments. And so this time I made a couple coats when, well, you know, winter is coming. So let's do some coats. And the first one I made is, is called Kelly Anorak. And... I love this. I love this coat, how it came out, and I like the pattern, and I was really surprised about, there's a lot of pieces to it, but it's very, very easy to make, unless you use laminated cotton. <laughs> so I used the laminated cotton, and what I found with it was you can't iron it, you can't uh, pin it, <laughs> so there's some difficulties associated with sewing with laminated cotton, but it did make a really nice raincoat. And the pattern is very well, um, you, you know exactly what to do. She tells you every piece is labeled, so you know exactly where it goes where. And I just use my serger. Um, if you're going to use a, a, this laminated cotton and for any of the top stitching, you need to use a Teflon foot. But the serger did it without a Teflon foot because I'm sewing on the inside, which is where the, there's no laminate on the back side. <clears throat> I bought some um, of the plastic snaps to use for the top for the hood the cuffs, and the pocket. And of course, the pattern has snaps that go down the front. And I was a little bit bothered by the fact that I had already put these on because I'm a, I'm a, I'm a symmetrical person. I like things to be symmetrical. And so these needed to be in the center because I was thinking, because I wasn't thinking, but I was thinking that the snaps would be in the center. Well, they can't be in the center because the zipper's in the center. They're supposed to be on the, over here on the edge. And the more I thought about it, I thought, I don't know if I'm going to like that look with these snaps centered to the placket and then these snaps going down this way. So at this point in time, I have not put the snaps on. And I may change my mind. I'm sure y'all have a lot of opinions and you can tell me about them and tell me whether I should put the snaps on or not. I have them to do if I want to, and they're very easy to put on. Um, I did iron this in a couple, you know, it came, I, I bought the fabric from Joann's, but I had to have it shipped because they didn't have enough of it in the store. And of course they folded it, you know, on the store it's on a roll. 
So they folded it and it's wrinkled and it's like, oh my gosh, how am I going to get this pressed? So I got a pressing cloth and a Teflon cloth and I, I pressed it some. But what I found out what happened when you did that with this particular iron on um, laminated cotton was it turned it real shiny. And, and you probably can't tell in the video, but this is actually kind of a dull finish on the, on the, on the outside, on the laminated side, which I really liked and I didn't like the shiny side. So I just quit ironing it. <laughs> you know, I was just like, forget it. But what the problem with that comes is I wanted to do flat felled seams because I think those look really nice, but I could not fold them enough and get it, get it folded so that it looked real. That it wasn't lumpy or it wasn't you know, moving on me to, in order to do that because you, you couldn't pin it. And where, you, where you're trying to do the seams, you can't really clip it. So I just did a, a faux flat felled seam, which just folds the seam underneath. It folds the seam underneath and then you just top stitch right up by the seam. And of course I use my serger on all the edges. And for laminated cotton, you don't even have to do that. But I think it looks a lot better if you do have a nice serged edge. So this is the Kelly Anorak by Closet Cool. Speaking of coats, I also made this. And if you'll remember, I guess it's the year of the duster because I think it was um, Lisa to, in, back in September made a duster coat out of faux suede. Of course, I already had mine cut and made when I found that out. So, oh well, we'll make another one. So, this is the Dakota duster. In the and it's by Serendipity Studio. And this is a stinking cute coat. Uh, and there's a lot of variations of the ways you can make it. You can make it with a mandarin collar or a straight collar. Or you can make it with, uh, you can make it shorter and you can actually have some that have, um, you can make it without the yoke in the back if you want. And there's even one that has little ruffles uh, at the bottom of it that are really cute. I I'm thinking this would be really cute done up in a denim with the ruffles on the back in, in, in the short version. I made a long version. I did use the, I did on the back put the yoke with the, with the scallops. And again, the suede fabric, it's got a poly, it, it's, it's faux suede, so it's got a polyester backing. And you can iron on from the back, but you can't iron, you can't really, unless you use a, a really good pressing cloth, it's really hot, hard, it's hard to iron on the suede side. So again, I ran into the same problem with the seams that I ran in with the Kelly Anorak in the sense that I really wanted to do a uh, flat felt seam because I thought that would look really nice, but I ended up doing the faux seam instead. The difference between the flat felt seam and the, float, the faux flat felt seam is that you just have the open seam in the back here and then you just top stitch it close to the seam. In a flat felt seam, you actually turn that under so you don't see any raw edge. But again, I could not get it so that it stayed where I wanted it uh, with that thick suede. I just, it just didn't like it. So I'd rather, rather have the, fo the faux suede than have one that didn't look right. And these buttons I found at Hobby Lobby. And originally I was going to put on some um, nickel or uh, you know, black buttons to go with the coat because it's all black on the inside. And then I saw these buttons at Hobby Lobby that are, look kind of like cork. And it's like, oh my God, they're the perfect color. They're cork. They're, they're going to go great on this coat. And so I got those instead. This coat was fast to make. You know, it's always the cutting out and the marking that takes a little bit of time. But as far as sewing it together, you have this front piece and then a side front. And then the back has got three pieces associated with it. The scallop thing. But it just goes together really, really fast. And then finally the collar. And like I said, there's also an option for a mandarin collar if you like that style rather than the fold down collar. And again, I surged, I just used my serger so all the edges are finished and surged and there's not, there's no lining, but it's a very comfortable coat and it goes on very easy and it's really pretty warm because it is this faux suede so it's kind of heavy fabric. Um, my only complaint I guess about it would be because it's difficult to iron, you know, when you get those little bit of puckers in the seam as you're sewing, uh, those were hard to get out. And I, I felt like sometimes uh, the side seams were pulling up a little bit. And then of course it was really hard to get a really nice flat hem because you just can't iron it flat very well. But I think all in all, it came out really great and I will wear it, I really like it. Um, of course the pattern comes just like the anorak comes with all the different sizes. 
So you have a lot of flexibility in what sizes you want to make. And um, this is actually the largest size that they had in the pattern that I made for myself. <clears throat> so this is the Dakota Duster by Serendipity Studio. So next up is Zelda. This is a Sally tomato pattern for a little purse. And, you know, I grew, when I was in high school, I thought that I should go to Berkeley and be a hippie because it was in the 70s. And so when I saw, and I, I had a jacket that was fringed, and so and I had a, a poncho that was fringed, you know, fringe was in. And so when I saw this, it was like, okay, I'm hearkening back to my hippie days. And so I thought this was a cute purse and it would go great with my coat. So I used the same fabric uh, and it's made, it's really nice because it has this kind of blank canvas on the top that you can use for some embroidery. So. I, and you don't have to, but I embroidered this with, uh, it's an old Anita Good design called Into the Wild. And so this is a horse head. I'm actually giving this person my granddaughter who loves horses and it's a good size for her. It's a very simple uh, jack, uh, jacket. It's a very simple purse to make because there's not much to it and it's small. Uh, the trickiest part is the zipper on top. You know, it's not inset and it's not covered. It is actually the top of the little purse. And so you have to make some pieces on the end to hold it in place. And then, so when, when you come up with your side seams, you don't catch the zipper. But she shows you how to do that. Um, it's simply lined. I just used some black cotton to line it. And there's a little slip pocket on the inside, just one little slip pocket. That's all it calls for. Of course, you make a bag, you can put a zipper in there. You can put two slip pockets, you can put no pockets, you know, whatever you want to do. The uh, bottom is boxed. And she shows you how to do that. Now the fringe, since I decided to make the, the purse out of the, suede, the faux suede, the back of the faux suede is that black kind of polyester knit stuff. And well, I don't want that to show. So I actually took two pieces of the faux suede and used some, um, I used, I used um, it's like applique wonder that's sticky on both sides, or like wonder under, and fused the pieces together so that they're the same front to back. And then I used my uh, rotary cutter to cut the fringe. So you don't see the back, the fringe on the back looks the same as the fringe on the front, which I like that a lot. And then uh, the tassel I also made, but I didn't do it front and back. So when you look at the tassel, you can see that on the back side, the black knit stuff. But for the tassel, that was fine. So I just made the tassel by cutting that and then putting in a little cap and had a little tassel that goes with it to pull the zipper. The Sally Tomato pat the pattern calls for a level one basic hardware kit, which is half inch uh, D rings and well, they're not they're not D rings, they're just actually uh, square rings and the sliding buckle. And we didn't get these in in time for me to use them for my sample, and I couldn't find half inch in any of the stores. So I made a one inch strap, and it's a cross body strap, so it goes you know all the way across like that. And um, I also made, since I use using one inch rings, I also obviously made it a one inch strap and not a half inch strap. This is also the suede. And of course you've got it folded over four times to make the strap. So it's a little thick and it was a little thick in the slider ring um, doing that, but you can do that. And so I made it a little bit differently than what she said to do. Um, but I think it came out really cute. And I just kind of used a uh, oily black uh, hardware for that. So this is the Zelda purse. She says it's uh, reminiscent of the flapper styles of the 20s. I say it's reminiscent of the 70s hippies. Next up, okay, well now what would so fun be without zipper bags, right? Everybody makes zipper bags. I, and I've made a few for, for different so funs, but uh, I think for this one, I really started off with actually the zipper. <laughs> I found these really cool zipper tape that was the iridescent multicolored rainbow stuff with iridescent pulls. And I thought, I've got to make something with those zippers because I really like them. So I found this pattern, which is the double zip gear bag, version 2.0. And there's three sizes. And of course, they're, it's a by Annie pattern. So you know there's going to be mesh involved. And you know there's probably going to be fold over elastic involved. And sure enough, there is. So... This is the largest bag, very nice sized. And it's got the mesh pockets on the inside with, with the fold over elastic. And you can decide, 
I left this one long, and on the other side, I split it down the middle. So, of course, that's your choice as to how you want to do those inside pockets. On the outside, you have one zipper compartment that's fabric, and then the other zipper compartment over here is mesh. Okay. So you need a lot of zippers. You need four zipper pulls for each. One, you need two of these if you want to make all three bags. And you'll need 12 zipper pulls. The bag comes with seven, so we brought in additional zipper pulls as well in case you want to make more than one bag. Um, you'll also need a couple packages depending on your color scheme. Uh, it takes more than one package of elastic to make uh, more than one. You can use one for one bag, but you need more than that for two. Um, I use rivets just to uh, secure my handle, my uh, pulls, zipper pulls, and the pull for the, the double zipper. Um, and then it's it's got soft and stable, you know, our, our, our traditional soft and stable is on in the middle. So the um, it's it they're really it's really pretty easy to sew. And of course, you know, the Viani, she gives you all the little slips of paper that you can use when you cut out your fabrics to keep them all straight. Um, she, uh, her instructions are excellent and she gives you a code where you can go online and launch a video if you're struggling with something. I found her directions to be excellent without needing that. I did, um, of course, it, I quilted the fabric, um, on my embroidery machine and, and she tells you, you know, what size you need to cut to quilt the fabric and then out of that quilted fabric, then you cut down the different pieces you need for the sides and the bag itself and the and the flap that's what you need the quilted fabric for but the, the lining then is of course quilted with it's a sandwich of the outside fabric the soft and stable and the lining and so you have raw edges so when you put the bag together of course you have raw edges because your lining was quilted with the top you don't put in lining in separate and so then you just do some bias binding and you have to use bias binding because of the curves and you just do some bias binding around the raw edges to finish it off and make it look really nice. One of the mistakes that I think I made in the zippers is I, when I top stitched, so I put the zipper in and then I top stitched close to the, to the zipper teeth. And I probably should have, and I, I always like my top stitching to be about an eighth of an inch from the seam. That's just my preference. Because of the way this made, if the, if the top stitching had been down a little further, it would have held this, this down better and you wouldn't have quite seen all that when you open the zipper. And, uh, you know, nobody's really gonna see it, but that's what I would do differently. I would top stitch a little further from the seam to make sure that zipper, uh, the flange on the zipper covers what you're doing down there. So this is the large, and this is the medium. Made exactly the same way. Just did some different colors on that. Like I said, the more, the more I looked at those zippers, I knew I had to find some really colorful fabric. I think this is the fabric that Terry actually used last month in one of her bags. And then this is the small. And this is kind of like the size you would expect to see, you know, as a, my dad would used to call a dot bag, where he would carry his shaving stuff in when he traveled. Uh, that's kind of the size at that. So all those went together fairly quickly. Of course, the cool thing is what to me takes the longest. And I got that done and then put the bags together in a couple days time. Again, you need a couple packages of the zipper tape if you're gonna make more than one bag. You need a couple packages of the, zip, of the foldover elastic if you're gonna make more than one bag. Um, there's plenty of mesh for, one, for all the bags and you'll need more zipper pulls because each bag needs four zipper pulls. So that is the double zip gear bag by Annie. Next up is, another, is an embroidery item and this is called mug rug sewing. I guess it's mug rug season because I know that um, we had some mug rugs last month, I think, and I know there's some Christmas mug rugs out there from OESD. I saw these, and these are from Lunchbox Quilts. I like, I like their embroidery stuff. One of the differences between these and the stuff like from OESD is these are not, you can do the embroidery in the hoop, but they're not, the whole mug rug is not made in the hoop. So they, in the kit that you, in the, if you buy the pad, the disc for this, it comes with four of these bolsal mug rug blanks, which are the, the stiff bolsel that are fusible on each side. Four come with the pattern, but we brought an extra in case you want to make more than four uh, mug rugs. And there's six patterns in, so there's six patterns and they give you four mug rug blanks. I'm not sure why they do that. So, but I made four of them and, um, but you know, these designs are cute and they would also be cute 
on um, any number of things, a tote bag, a tea towel, uh, something uh, like a little sewing bag that you might have in your sewing room. So they're, you know, they're versatile little designs. There's the uh, rotary cutter buttons, sewing machine, and of course our tomato. There's also um, one that's thread and one that's a dress form, a wire dress form that I didn't make. So these, um, you embroider what you want and then you cut, cut it a little bit larger than the bolsal form and then you fuse it to the bolsal form. And then you trim it to size. And then of course you're gonna have to use bias binding because you've got these curves. And sometimes I think, why don't they just square the corners up? <laughs> That's a lot easier than making bias binding. But they look cute, and I, I thought the polka dots were a nice touch. And I'm, I'm one of these people that I don't like. I hand sew the back of all my bindings. I hand sew the binding, the back of the binding on my um, bags. I hand sew the back of the binding on these because I, I don't like the looks. I, I don't like them to be uneven on the back when you, you know, you sew on the front to make them even and then you look on the back side and it's a little wider here and a little narrower there. That drives me nuts. Whereas if I hand sew them, I can adjust all that and make them look better. So I always hand sew. It's a little bit difficult on the back of the bolsal, but it was, it was possible. And I just hand sewed those around and um, ended up with these cute little uh, mug rug coasters. So again, great Christmas gifts for somebody who's a sewist in your life. I almost, when I'm sewing for Sew Fun, I'm having lunch in my sewing room. So it's nice to have, you know, something I can put my drink on. It'll, it'll catch up some of the moisture and everything. And these are, you know, even though this is a stiff uh, interfacing that's in here, uh, they're washable. So that's Mug Rug Sewing by Lunchbox Quilts. All right, now we're gonna get into some of the quilts that I made. And the first one is a wall hanging and that really turned out to be, um, it's embroidery. So I was like, well, I got a couple of embroidery projects to do. I'll do this one. And then it turned out to be a lot of quilting too, but it came out really cute. It's called uh, Candy Cane Christmas, and it's one of the Claudia's creations. And we do a lot of Claudia's uh, projects in So Fun. I've done several of them in the past. I really like her work. This just turned out to be a little bit more than I expected. I think when I looked at it, I kind of thought it was this. Turns out it's all of that. <laughs> and so, but it came out very pretty as a wall hanging. And it is um, done very simply in terms of embroidery in that it's pretty much just three colors, mostly black, with a little bit of red and green to add the highlight of the candy canes. But everything else is black outline. Now, she'll tell you in her instructions to use tearaway stabilizer for your embroidery. Don't do that because you cannot tear the embroidery, the backing away from all these small spaces created by the line art that's done on the, um, in the design. So I had used a, um, an OES, no, um, Florian, R and K has a wash away stabilizer that some of the fibers stay behind. And I used that, but I really didn't like it. And I think if I had it to do all over, cause you still couldn't, it was iron on and you still couldn't really get the stuff out of there, even when you rinsed it off a little bit, cause some of the fibers stay behind. So if I were gonna do this again, I would use just no-show mesh. You know, iron it real good, steam it real good to start with so it won't shrink up on you when you're using it, and then just use it and leave it in place. And then you don't have to worry about trying to get it out of there. So, but, um, but it still came out very cute. Um, another thing that we had to struggle, not struggle is not the right word, that I had to fool with, was the jump stitches between the letters. So the letters are close together and there's these teeny tiny little jump stitches in between. And they frustrate me because you, it doesn't matter how small they are, you see them. So, and they gotta go. <laughs> but what I found to be really helpful in trying to do jump stitches like that, and I've tried all kinds of ways, but I think the best way for me is, is get a pair of blunt end tweezers that are really good. Not, um, not forceps, not serrated anything, just these little, those little tweezers, um, the blunt end ones that have a really good grip. Uh, so you snip the thread with some spine scissors or a seam ripper, you pull on the end with those tweezers and then cut as close to the fabric as you can without cutting your fabric. And that works really well and you get, you get, it, you get it so you don't have any little tails left, you don't have any little jump stitches left, it looks really good. So that's my favorite way now to get rid of those really short jump stitches is to use some, a, a seam ripper or some really fine scissors to trim it 
and then those tweezers to pull it up so you can cut the, the tail off. <clears throat> um, qu quilting on this, so then it had the, um, my gnomes are shedding all over everything. Um, it has the pinwheels in the corners as a nice little accent, and it has the candy cane border, so that was some piece work that you had to do. And then I just quilted it with uh, in, uh, invisible thread because I wanted to use, I put white on the back. I could have used white or red, but I didn't want um, red showing through because you know, I always have a little bit of trouble with my bobbin thread showing when I do my quilting. Um, so, but I used invisible thread on the top and I finally got my tension the way I liked it so I didn't get a lot of the bobbin thread coming up. So I'm pretty happy with the quilting, but I just did an edge to edge quilting, which is just a little snowflake and some little swirls to make the candy cane uh, machine, candy cane Christmas machine quilt. And I put a sleeve on it so I will be able to hang it up in the house. Another smaller quilt that I made, <clears throat> and I made it for my granddaughter, and she loves tigers. And so we have to do the Antonio tiger pattern. And this is a um, this is Elizabeth Hartman design. And you know, she has a lot of these really colorful animal blocks that she made. I believe the Colorado Springs store at one time had a block of the month thing that they were doing that was Elizabeth Hartman, different zoo animals. And she's got some really cute patterns. And she loves tigers. My granddaughter loves tigers. And so this is called Antonia Tiger. And when I got it, I thought it was going to be a wall hanging. And it turns out to be a little bit taller, <laughs> a little bit quick, bigger quilt, quilt than I thought it would be. So it'll just be a lap quilt for her. And gosh, you know, there's the Auburn Tigers, the LSU Tigers, the Detroit Tigers. There's lots of ball teams that are tigers. And just think how cute this would be done in that team's colors. Uh, in fact, I saw one online. My, I'm from Louisiana. And I'm not a big LSU fan, but a lot of my family are. And they, somebody had done one online that had the LSU colors of purple and gold. And it was really cute. So think about that. If you've got somebody that's a Tiger fan, either they like Tigers or they have a Tiger ball team that they like. What a cute quilt. And you could do this. There's nine blocks on this. Certainly you could do two by two, three by, you know, you certainly could do it smaller or even a pillow. So um, this is Antonia Tiger by Elizabeth Hartman. Some of the notions that, uh, I've showed you some of the notions that I used in a particular project, but there's a few notions that we brought in that I might have used in more than one project, or maybe I didn't use at all, but were pretty cool notions. Uh, one of the ones that I didn't use at all, but I really liked are these really cute um, notebooks from, uh, that are old McCall's Patterns covers. But they're just uh, cute little line notebooks, like your journal, these notes of things you're sewing. They have a, they're stitched as, and instead of stapled for the for the, uh, the spine. And on the back, they show you, you know, if you were going to make that pattern, what all you needed as far as fabric. So it's just like like, like a, a pattern envelope, but as a notebook. And I use um, notebooks. I use composition books. I use all kinds of books to keep track of what I did for a particular project. So you could even have one of these, you know, and have two or three projects in it and put a label on it so you could quickly find, well, how did I do that again? And what did I run into? And so we brought in these cute little uh, McCall's pattern notebooks. Again, these would be great stocking stuffers for the sewist in your life or for yourself. Glue, glue pins are in, uh, in, indispensable in the sewing room, I think. Particularly ones that you gotta make sure you get some that don't give, gum up your needles, but that were, are tacky enough to hold in place what you're sewing, and that will, will set up fairly quickly so that you can do that. And that, um, and make sure, of course, that they dry clear, and you probably wanna wash it out when you're done, so water soluble is good. And Sewline has these glue pins, and we also brought in the, the refills. The um, but these are great. They're, you know, instead of basting, you can use them to set down where a zipper is going to go and keep it, you know, without pinning or basting. If you have something that's just hard to pin, um, that you need to hold in place a little bit, glue it. You know, it's a temporary thing, but it, it was great for a stop gap in the sewing room when you just can't. And there's been times when I've been sewing, don't tell anybody this, uh, a quilt that I just couldn't get the seams to line up. I pinned, I sewed, 
I ripped out, which is what I'm talking about next, <laughs> and I just never could get the seam to line up. And I finally glued it, temporary glued it together right where it needed to be and then sewed it. And that was the only way I could finally get that silly seam to be straight like I wanted it. So, you know, do the next block. So glue, don't be afraid to glue, use it, it's great. And speaking of seam rippers, I, I, <laughs> I don't know how many sew funds I've shown different types of seam rippers. I'm looking, I'm looking, looking, looking for that one that's going to make my life a little bit easier because for every two things I sew, I've probably ripped something out once. It's not one to one, but it's pretty close because I'm, I just got to, I just got to look right. And if I don't have, I'm not happy the way it looked, I got to do it again. And that's where the seam ripper comes in. And so we brought in this, uh, it's one of these Taylor Seville products and it's the magic retractable two-in-one seam ripper. It's got the bigger seam ripper on one side, smaller seam ripper on the other. And there's a little retractable blade that you push it up for one blade or down for the other. Um, at first I thought, I don't know that I like this because I think it's, I think the seam ripper needs to be further out away from the casing. But the more I used it, the more I liked it. It's really sharp. The little one's really pointy to get in those small spaces that you need to take a seam out. And it was handy. And then I could close it down because I have broken seam rippers by dropping them. Um, and so if you, because my floor is a tile floor in my sewing room. So if you retract the blade back down, then it's safe inside this little plastic case. It's right there by my sewing machine. And I use it a lot. I haven't worn this one out yet, but it's probably coming. And finally, I have a steam iron that I use on my big ironing board. It's one of those Euro steam irons. And I love it because it's, it's, it's terrible as a dry iron. You know, don't try to do anything without steam. But as a steam iron, it's wonderful, but it's big. And so we, ran, we, we, have the, we found these reliable irons and it's called the OVO 615G. And it is also just steam. There is no temperature control on it. Don't think you can, it doesn't get, the plate doesn't get that hot. I mean, it'll, you know, you don't want to touch it, but it's not that hot. So you don't want, you can't use it as a dry iron, but as a steam iron, you can't beat it for small, a small steam iron, something. And so I use this when I, when I, when we go camping and I take my sewing machine with me, I have this with me as well, because you need that really good steam, you know, to get those seams flat, the iron, you know, whatever you're doing. And I love this one. And I really, I have used it and used it and used it. It's also just a garment steamer if you because you can if you press this button, it steams. When you let go of the button, it quits steaming. So you can use it like this, you know, on a tablecloth or a coat or something you're trying to iron. It just is a steamer, and it also comes with a little tool that snaps on that you can then use to to use a little brush for some some other way to do some steaming. I'm not sure what you use it for. Um, and then it comes with this case, which serves because it's got the Teflon or the uh, silicone um, surface that you can rest your iron on. There's also a little fold out support, but you can rest your iron on. And then of course you can, you know, while it's cooling off, you can set it to cool off. And then it becomes the travel case for the iron. So it's really great. Um, I know we have, I think they showed you uh, Terry, when she did hers last month, had the little uh, sewing, the iron caddy that she made, and we had the little irons that go in that. This probably would fit in that. You might, I, I'm not certain. I didn't measure it to see. Um, and that little iron is great. And I have that little iron, too, and I use it in my embroidery hoops when I'm ironing an appliques. But if you want a good little, a small, good steam iron or a good steamer, this is the one you want. So this is the OVO. It's by Reliable, and Reliable makes really, really nice irons. So um, I, I highly recommend this one. And another thing about it, it doesn't, it's no auto shut off. Uh, so it's always ready to use. You just have to remember to unplug it when you're done. And there's no switch. It's just plugged in or not plugged in. So be aware of those little things about it. So one of the, um, one of my things I was trying to do with our Christmas projects this year was to do something that you could do between now and Christmas. And you get ready for Christmas for gifts or for yourself or your home decorating, whatever. And obviously this quilt is probably not something that you're going to be able to make between now and Christmas. So get started now for next Christmas because it is so cute. So we, we gave homage to the gnomes early on in the, um, in the presentation, in fact, the beginning. And now this is for the elves. So this is a bunch of elf feet and one hat. And it's called, appropriately, Elfing Around. And the product is, uh, the pattern is by Basic Gray. 
The fabrics are Moda's Better Not Pout collection. We didn't bring that in, but uh, you certainly can still find it. And it's um, a really, it looks kind of intricate and kind of complicated, but quite frankly, it's a very easy quilt to make. There's not a lot of matching that you have to do. I mean, this, you know, these are all in a row, so you're not trying to match e anything to either side of that. You got a little bit of work you got to do down here to match up some corners, like that corner there, but it's really pretty simple. Uh, and the cuffs of the, of the boots and the cuff of the hat is paper pieced. And so those are very easy to show. And of course, with paper piecing, you get those really nice points. For those of you who don't know about paper piecing, I just want to give you a quick little rundown about how it's done. In the pattern from Basic Gray, you get a sheet of a template, which is your paper piecing template. And then you copy that onto Carol Doak's foundation paper. Some people use, um, and we brought that, a package of that in. I know we use this a lot here. But we also, uh, you can also use freezer paper. You can use some different things. But what you want to be able to do is have some paper that you can sew through, but also that tears away easily. So you have to keep those things in mind when you're picking what, what you want to copy your pattern onto. So I copied this onto the Carol Doak foundation paper and then just trimmed it down. And this is obviously the pattern for one of the cuffs. And there you'll see that they're numbered A1 through A9. And she tells you in the pattern what size of squares, uh, what size of rectangles to cut in order to use this. But I found that they were a little bit small. You can make them bigger, but there's no reason because you're going to trim them down. So I made mine a little bigger. But what you do basically is you start with A1, and that goes right side up, covering the A1 and overlapping it because you're going to want a quarter. You're going to want a quarter inch seam here. So you want to overlap it by at least a quarter inch, but don't worry if it's more than that. So you do that, and actually you do it on the back side. So you kind of you have a light box or something you can see through. Do it on the back side, and then you turn it over, and you sew that seam. Okay. And now you're ready for the second piece, and they're going to go right sides together on the back side. And you're going to want to make sure that you've got enough for this seam, but also that you have enough of a quarter inch seam over here. And so if you put this black, I'm showing you from this side, but you're doing it on the other side. You put that on there like that, and you got plenty of fabric. And now you're going to sew this seam again. Okay, you, you sewed it to sew it and sew it down, but you're going to sew it again. And then what you do when you're done, so you have all this fabric. And this, I'm sorry, I said that wrong. This goes this way like that. So it overlaps. You sew down here and then what's going to happen is you're going to fold it over, right, like that. And you're going to cover up that triangle. And then what you do is you take this and you fold it back along that line, like that. And you're going to cut your quarter inch fabric there so you get your quarter inch seam. So you got it sewn down here and now you can just make a quarter inch seam there, right? And of course, you know, it's difficult to do without being sewn down. So now you have A1 and A2 in place. Let's just pretend that that's sitting here like that, all like it's supposed to be. And then of course you take your next fabric. Again, you're working from the back and you're putting right sides, to, right sides together. And so you put that down. I always, always wanted to do it backwards, but this way. And then you sew that seam so that when you fold it over, oh, it should have been black. <laughs> but you get the idea. So that's, you know, so you have black, green, black, and then you, you sew it. You fold it down along that seam line and trim your seam. Now, one of the things that makes it really, and we didn't bring these in, but we've shown these before. I brought, I wrote a blog on how to use the add-a-quarter rulers, um, so you can look that up. But uh, the add-a-quarter ruler helps you. This little ledge, is it, it makes it able to put the paper right in there. And then whatever's hanging over here is a quarter inch, and you just trim it off. So it's, this makes it really easy to get your quarter inch seams, and that's just perfect for the, um, the because you got you got fabric all up in here, and you fold it over and make your quarter inch seam. So that's the added quarter ruler. I'm sure we probably have them. If we don't have them, we certainly can order for you, but they may even be on our notion wall. You can take a look and see. So that's how we did these. Now the only other trick is that in the hat, it is also paper pieced. All of this. 
And if you have fabric that's directional, and I should also mention that, if you have fabric that's directional anywhere in your quilt, make sure that you've got the words or the directions going in the right way once you put the, with the boots together. So you have to be careful about that. But because this is also paper pieced, when I first started fooling around with these, trying to get it paper pieced, I had a little bit of trouble with, because this has got a little bit of a check pattern to it, and I didn't want checks going this way or on a, you know, uh, 45 degrees or whatever. And so you just, just takes a little bit of playing with it and orienting it if you have uh, directional fabric when you try to use the, te the template to do the paper piecing. But all of this is paper pieced and of course all of that. And that's, but you'll notice if like, for example, in the, is it here? Those checks are on the diagonal a little bit because I didn't think about it when I made those. And then when I started doing this, it was like, oh, but it's okay for the hat brim. So just be careful about that. If, if it had been words, it would have looked really weird. So just be careful. So the places where I have words, just make sure you get it oriented right. And I think that was the only directional. Well, some of this stuff is directional too. So you just gotta make sure you got it, everything oriented the same way. Um, I quilted this with a, if you can kind of see it, a hat kind of look, and there's some boots, a boot look. Um, that's, there, there's a whole hat and there's some boots in here. Uh, to make it go with the quilt. I think if I had it to do over again, I probably would have condensed my quilting a little bit. I think it's a little bit looser than I, and I always run into that. I, I look at it on my screen and I think it's fine. Of course, I use the robotics, but I just wished I had um, you maybe just made more patterns across so it would have been a little tighter because a little, a little bit puffy in some places, which tighter quilting takes care of. Um, on the back, it's just this really pretty fabric that's still in that same line of the, um, Moda's um, Better Not Pout fabric line, and I just quilted it white with white and got this cute little quilt called Elfing Around. I'm ready. <laughs> so leaving Christmas, let's talk about Valentine's. How about this cute little quilt called Heartstrings from V and Company? And what I want to tell you about this quilt is it's a lot of piecing. <laughs> There's a lot of little two and a half inch squares in this quilt, and one of the things that made that really nice is this new ruler from Quilter Select that's two and a half inches wide by 12. Because it's a perfect way to cut these out and you just, you know, line up the edges and, and it's, you don't have to really measure because you know it's two and a half inches wide. Um, these blocks on this quilt are a heart and then in between are these gray blocks. The fabric, um, I cannot remember who it came from whether it's, I don't, I don't remember who the manufacturer is, but it's called, um, it's a, it's a ombre. And so the out, the edges of the selvage edges of the fabric have more dots of the gold and the color dots than the center does. And then the, also the color gets, it's lighter in the center and gets darker as it goes towards the edges. And in her pat, and you know, I get the pattern and I'm cutting it out and I cut everything. And for the hearts, everything is pieced block by block. But for the center, these gray squares, you actually take a piece of, of one gray color and a strip of another gray color uh, with the fabric and sew those together. And then you cut your two and a half inch pieces that are two blocks wide. And so, you know, you cut all those out and then you start piecing them together. And I wasn't paying attention to the picture because if you can see in this picture, you'll notice that she has the, all of the dark grays are almost blacks in the center and then at the corners and then the lighter grays around the edges. And mine are just random, okay? I really like this look. I wish I had noticed it before. I would have done it this way, but I also like this quilt. So hey, I'm good either way. The, um, so it's, you know, it's a lot of piecing. It's a lot of, so you make the squares and now you got to match all these seams as you put the blocks together. So be very, very accurate in your cutting and in your quarter inch seams because otherwise you're gonna have a heck of a time getting your lines to match up. Um, and also, as you get to these points on the hearts, make sure you iron those down and your seams are open really well. Otherwise you're gonna have lumps in a few places that I didn't do that very good. So those are kind of the lessons that I learned from that. Another lesson that I learned is no matter how careful you are and how, you, you know, how much you look at this quilt and think you know what you're doing, you're gonna find a mistake. <laughs> so, okay, so, you know, I, I sew this thing together. 
I put it on my long arm, I quilted it, and I quilted it with this cute little heart pattern. And I did make it denser, so I, I like the denser quilting a little bit better than the little looser quilting of the uh, elf, uh, elfing around. And I get it hung up here. Lynn is standing over there, and she says, Kathy, do you know you have a block wrong down here? I was like, well, I do what? <laughs> so down here on this heart, I got one block that's turned the wrong way. And it's a, so I have a broken heart on this quilt. Uh, and my heart has never been broken, so it's a little bit of a, a misnomer. But I'm trying to decide if I am um, crazy enough to think of it. And I'm not going to tear it out to fix it because I'm not that crazy. But I might take a block, make another block that's turned the right way, fold it under, you know, iron it real good, and then hand sew it in, and then just repeat the quilting on the top because it's not much, it's just that square and say, oh, look, it's all perfect. I haven't decided on that yet. I'll get y'all's opinion about it. So this is called Heartstrings by Van Company. So the projects that I've made this so fun have all been kind of, not all of them, but the, certainly the quilts have, have taken a lot of time, a lot of sewing, uh, a lot of piecing. And I thought, well, you know, I'm kind of ready for something a little simpler. And I was, uh, I ran across this pattern from Mountain Peak Creations called, um, um, bricks and I loved it because it's a center panel and then a little bit of block work nothing that really has to match up too much and a border and poof you got a cool looking little quilt and I love this fabric it's called um, Dino Punk and I found it at Holly's and so um, this went together so fast because you just take this center panel and then, um, and then you put those the squares, you know, which have some of the fabric repeats that are in the in the dinosaurs and stuff, and the gears because it's a punk, it's a punk thing. And sew it together. I, I made the top. I made the I pieced the top, including cutting it out, in about six hours. It was that fast. Whereas those guys we're talking about, you know, days and not hours. Um, so I'm really happy with that. And then I found the perfect. Um, quilting of these gears to go with it that I really liked. The only thing I had to finagle a little bit with this one is that the, um, the, the dimensions in the pattern call for this panel to be some number of inches wide. I can't remember off the top of my head. But when I did that, I would have lost the sides of these frame, this frame of the, of the, of the panel. And I really didn't want to do that because it would, I, to me it would look funny to only have three sides of that instead of you know showing it all the way around. So by making this a little wider, I had to adjust the sashings because I wanted I made the blocks the same size as the pattern. I made this the same size. So I had to adjust the sashings a little bit so that everything would fit. And that was the only adjustment that I had to make simply because I didn't want my I wanted my one of my panel to be a little bit wider than what they said. But other than that, it's a cute quilt. It goes fast. Um, I think my grandson's going to So I got the tigers for my granddaughter, and I got these dinosaurs, the punk dinosaurs for my grandson for Christmas. I think they're both going to like them. The back of the fabric is simply the uh, a repeat of some of what this, this looks like, and one of the fabrics that is in the small blocks, and uh, just quilted it with, um, it's gray, a really light gray fabric, on top, uh, top and bottom. So that is the bricks pattern, and it is from Mountain Peak Creations with the dino um dino punk fabric so that's all i have for you today for november 2021 so fun and you know what our usual practice for so fun is to have open house in december uh the so fun presenters will be there showing at least one project that they've done that hopefully will be something that will be an inspiration for christmas it's something that's you know the rule is make it something that's quick and easy to make last minute christmas gift and so that's what we, that's what we got going on. That's what we got planned. Uh, the presenters will be there. Rob, of course, will be there in all of his glory. Kasha will be showing, joining him, I'm sure. And it, right now it's scheduled for the second week in December, the same schedule as So Fun. So Tuesday, Aurora, Wednesday, Littleton, Thursday, Arvada, and Friday, Colorado Springs. But it's that second week. I'm not exactly sure what day that Tuesday is, but it's the second week in December. So we hope to see you there and we'll have some good food and some good times. Rob will be there and to thank everybody for all their support as well as the Soap Fun presenters. So thank you again for joining us and we'll see you next year. Thanks.